Was there a meeting last week, or nobody was around for KubeCon? Um, both. Yeah. I see notes from Wednesday, but but not Monday. Yeah, I did. Um, was KubeCon and. Uh, Makes sense. Oh, we have a blinking lights pull request from Froga. I got to mention that. Uh, yeah, this week is Thanksgiving in the US, so we may be missing. Yeah. Um, I guess you are typically out for the whole week or just uh, Thursday and Friday? Well, Thursday and Friday are the official holidays, but many people take it off. Kids are out of school all week. I'll, I'll be off Wednesday through Friday. Oh, okay. I guess we can start. What, what about Sebastian Hahn or, or uh, Jimmy Gare? Uh, Seb is taking the day off after traveling to KubeCon and stuff. Oh, okay. Covering. Juan Miguel's father's in the hospital, so he's uh, went back to his hometown and is taking care of him right now. So. Yeah, then I uh, hope his father recovers soon. Yeah. Sounds good to get started. Um, yeah, I yeah I, I really haven't looked into, into anything else than the SSH orchestrator. It was uh, a busy week. So um, that rook pull request is still waiting. About adding that Python client library to rook itself and then making use of it in Rook Orchestrator in, in Ceph. Um, still on my to do this. So, summary of the SSH Orchestrator last week. Um, the, we have a totality integration of the SSH Orchestrator right now, which is super awesome. Uh, we have made a lot of bug, bug fixes, like um, SE Linux permission problems, um, Python exceptions, really a lot of groundwork to make things working. Um, Zach from the Ceph Foundation is um, is overhauling the installation documentation for the SSH orchestrator, which is great, really great. Uh, and we have a new package-based installation mode for Ceph Daemon, so you can install Ceph Daemon via RPM package, and then instruct the SSH manager module to make use of that Ceph daemon which was installed via packages. Um, yeah, that's about a quick summary from what happened last week in the SSH orchestrator world. Any Questions, discussions, missing problems, missing things? No. Um, then, um, Travis? Oh, yep. Yeah, it looks like we have Sage now. Any other? Yeah. Uh, anything else on this SSH orchestrator? I guess maybe he has something. Your audio on, Sage? There we go. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm just um, trying to get a bunch of pull requests merged. Um, Sebastian, I'll probably ping you in the next hour with a bunch of those. And then um, what's next on my list? 
uh, some test improvements. Um, I think the big next step, though, is really around um, the SSH orchestrator provisioning the rest of the dashboard dependencies. Um, mm -hmm. And I need to talk to Paul about that. It's like 3 a.m. in Australia. It's a shame he can't make this meeting. Yeah. Um, um, and he, he can't even attend the Wednesday meeting because it's, I think, 10 p.m. Still too late. Yeah. Um, do we want to make a new upstream orchestrator meeting where Paul can definitely attend? I think that would be nice. We need to check with him and figure out what time that is. I'm not actually sure what the that, best. That would be. I mean, his day starts at around uh, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which would be probably bad for uh, Germany. And uh, it yeah. goes uh, eight hours beyond. So, I mean, there's no good time. Pulling in no. New Zealand. Maybe what we should do is just have two meetings. Um, have one maybe with Sage uh, people, Travis, and other people on the, you know, more time zone friendly. Maybe at the end of, you know, the East Eastern Standard Time day, and we could pick up Paul. It's his mid morning. I mean, would that work, Sage? We'll just have two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two meetings fine. Two meetings is yeah. fine. Yeah. And we'll just that way at least we'll have continuity. We'll bridge the, you know, bridge the issues because um, I know he has a. A lot of opinions, so do I. Um, I've been waiting to go back, Sage. We have to talk at some point as well. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Just make sure we're on the same page. Uh, I've yeah. talked and, I'm, and I'm really curious about what, what his opinions are, really. Yeah. Jeff, do you want to see if you can schedule that for today, later this afternoon? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I'm going to be talking with him. Let me just look at my calendar at... Uh, 2.30, if we want to say, um, ooh, i got to call at 3 p.m., maybe we could plan it for 4 p.m.? Are 4 you guys open? Eastern would be 3 p.m. for me. Yeah, that works. Okay. Um, and, and how many hours is that? And one, two, five hours. Yeah. Okay, that, that's manageable for me. It's... Uh... Well, I don't know, Sage, if we want to have the first one, we got to probably go over some uh, product-related downstream stuff as well. Yeah, I think maybe I'll the will be that. Well, so we can sync on a more uh, generic yeah. upstream one, uh, probably next one. You know, just I, I think okay. we get some things we got to resolve. Sounds good. Yep. All right. So I will put it in. Okay. All right. Okay. What else? Do we have anything else? Um, yeah, we have. If we want right. to actually discuss oh, these yeah. topics, yeah. Um, so, host labels to the SSH orchestrator. That that would be some kind of similar thing to how Rook stores mm -hmm. labels to hosts or to nodes. And yeah, the thinking is about adding that also to the SSH orchestrator too. Yeah, uh, provide solutions for for similar problems or provide a similar solution for a similar problem. Like where can uh, containers be be scheduled on? Yep. And where not? It's kind of a very a bit simpler mm -hmm. approach than um, Kubernetes, of course, but it it seems about right to go into the direction. Yep. Yep, I agree. Oh, sorry. So, how do those host labels work with SSH orchestrator? Is there some way you can discover the the host labels? It's just the CLI commands that add remove host. You can also set labels on the hosts. That's it. So in a GUI, you probably like click a bunch and say label for OSDs, click these ones, label them for MDSs, or had custom labels. My my thinking was that we would the labeling would allow arbitrary label names, but we would have 
generic labels um, that would, if you just label it for MDS, it'll it'll use those nodes to schedule MDS demons. So you don't have to specify host names all the time. Great, makes sense. Cool, so just tr keeping track of our own labels instead of using Kubernetes node labels. Well, and the, I mean, the SSH orchestrator would do it in this case. For yeah. We would have those same commands would just pass through to the Kubernetes API to just add and remove labels, I assume. There's just a kubectl command to do that. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that way, the um, yeah. the um, the dashboard you would see the cube labels. I don't know. We might have to filter them or something so that it's only the ones that are relevant to Rook, or maybe they're in the Rook namespace. I don't know how labels work in Kubernetes. Um, yeah. The labels are just on nodes, so we'd need some sort of um, filter prefix to see or yeah, yeah, some list of well-known Rook labels or something. Yeah. Yep. Um, but it'd be nice if this is the same experience you could to change which ones get MDSs or whatever. Mm, yeah. Okay, exposing the, the labels just... for, yeah. If we just put a, like a rook prefix on all of the labels we care about, or yeah, yeah, I think that'd be fine. Yep. Yep. And I think don't need. I, I don't think that we should care about any other orchestrators right now. Just SSH orchestrator and rook, and the other one, yeah, don't don't care. Um. Then there was some discussion about making the SSH orchestrator declarative, um, like um, kind of how Rook works. So you have a bunch of um, specifications, and then using the orchestrator command line to modify that specification, and then making the SSH orchestrator apply that specification to the real world, kind of how Rook works, basically. My sense is that we could definitely do that. Um, and it kind of seems like we probably want to eventually, but it also seems like we don't have to go all the way down that road. Everything would still work sort of if we sort of sort of that part way the mode so that for example if we add all these labels um, then the labels could be used only when you're updating a service when you issue the imperative command to update the mdss or add an mds or whatever it is um, and making it declarative would basically mean storing what storing this the declarative state and then having something an operator thing in the background that like tries to achieve it. That makes sense? Yeah, would, would be kind of an intermediate step, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that's basically how DeepSea works right now. So you have some kind of configuration and then whenever you run a generic update command and it applies that configuration and to the real world but only if you actually run a command yeah yeah I think that seems like a next I mean it's an easy code change to get to there <laughs> so we were going to do it anyway um, and then we can kind of decide if we want to go all in or not I'm kind of of minds about that. At some level, it feels like the the state of the system is should be like what hosts are up and what services are deployed on those hosts. So the, that state is sort of the real world as opposed to what you want the real world to be. Um, but I don't know. I, yeah, they're good both ways. Hmm. Do 
we already need some kind of um, scheduling algorithm? I think so. I think, well, I think as soon as we have host labels, um, I think the next step would be to um, create a scheduler that will just randomly assign a service to a node, um, either across all nodes or the ones that are labeled. And then you can iterate on that to then look at the services and try to pick the one with the fewest services. Like you can just do some like really simple, really simple scheduler. Um, but that basically will mean that all of all of the other things you don't have to specify a placement specification like you do right now. You don't have to pass toast names all over the place. And so the experience will be more or less equivalent between when you're using Rook and when you're using SSH. Yeah. We'll just because users for the most part like they don't care where their manager runs, like they just have the five nodes on their cluster. They want to create some gateways, like <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> they just want it to work. So um and if they do care, then they can add labels, and then everything else will still work. So. Mm. I think it makes sense. Yeah, the random okay. scheduler will probably get us there in 99% of the cases. Or... Well, I had some some bad feedback uh, gotten from someone at, at SUSE who actually wrote some schedulers for Kubernetes about a random scheduler or a pure random scheduler. Uh, I, I'm trying to get some more feedback from them. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't suggest us releasing with the random scheduler, but we can merge it like tomorrow, and then everything would work to a first approximation until we have something slightly smarter. Or I could just write the fewest service one also is pretty easy. Just look at the inventory and count services and just pick the one. That's mm -hmm. slowly, slowly. I think the real question is, um, right now, um, we're not really doing anything around setting limits on any of these containers. We don't restrict how much CPU they get or anything like that. And so um, that's really where the scheduler probably needs to get a little bit intelligent. Like how many cores does this get? How much memory does this need? Do I have actually enough memory on this host? Not all hosts are created equal, that stuff. And that may or may not like do those resource limitations. Are those something that we want to um, unify with Rook? Because like Rook, I think hard codes basically what those are. Or it has a same default for them. Yeah. Well, in the CRs you can specify them, but yeah, there's a default in the examples. There's a default. Yeah. So, uh, like, I don't know if we want to surface that through the orchestrator API, so you can say, like, I want to give my Redis gateways lots of memory, and that'll work on both. Um. But that we, is we sort of the to... prerequisite before we can make a smart scheduler that takes those things into consideration. I think. We have to pass it through the to the SSH orchestrator anyway, so it will pop up in the orchestrator API, and then we can just make yeah. use of it for Rook. As long as we yeah. make care, we, we take care that they are compatible. Yeah. We just haven't, I don't think we haven't contemplated that, right? Like how, let's figure out how we want to do that. So it kind of seems like that, that we're creating um, something like a lightweight Kubernetes and <laughs> like yeah, a full yep. developer of Kubernetes. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I mean, these are this. It's not like we saw Kubernetes and said we wanted to re-implement it. These are problems that we had before Kubernetes came along, right? Because users didn't know how many gateways to put on a server. They were just doing all this stuff manually, and so the user experience was was shitty. So I think this is this is something that belongs in the orchestration layer. And if it's gonna be there then we have to have a sort of a a simple simple way to do it. We we just have to make sure that it is always possible to specify exactly where each each service would run. Yeah. Yeah exactly. And I think also we have to make sure that um, we are pointing people in the right direction. So when they start requesting features that um, yeah. are not that easy to implement, we should not like give in and, yeah, yeah. and like implement everything in the SSH orchestra that it slowly becomes yeah. a Kubernetes clone or whatever. Yep. 
think it was clear from the beginning that the SSH orchestrator will get some ideas from Kubernetes and Rook. Or we should we should push people in that direction. I agree. Uh, actually, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, one of my questions is I've just sort of certain been assuming that once you're, um, uh, whatever continuation completion thing merges that it'll be easier to make expand the work the size of the worker queue in the SSH yep. orchestrator so we can have lots of stuff going into the background is that true um it will make it easier but it's not impossible right now okay um okay. well as soon as that merges then i think we had, should work on that because I, I think we need to figure out how to make like service discovery for example we want to have like like be having 10 or more SSH connections open in parallel, scraping all the hosts and not like iteratively walking through them or something. Right now, that parallelism is hard coded to one yeah. in the SSH orchestrator. So there, when, when creating the thread pool, there is a hard coded one to make sure only one thread at a time is working right now. So we have everything serialized right now. Um, that should be kind of trivial to make it work in parallel, but um, you have to be careful. It's still, if you have a very big cluster and still have only five threads or something like that, it's still going to be take a lot, a long time until everything is provisioned. Um, yeah. So having much more parallelism than the number of threads um, would mean that we have to use a different approach like um starting an operation on the host and closing the connection and then uh querying the state of the connect of the of the operations later on but that that's a lot of complexity i mean these are all greenlit threads right they're not real threads that's just they, they doing are its little real threads oh really okay really Re um cpu threads or or kernel threads Interesting. But they all, that's in the same interpreter, so they're all sharing the same gill. Like, they don't actually yeah, need to be. Yeah, sharing the same gill. Yeah, but that, that's not a big problem. If you're waiting for another, the network to reply, then right. the gill is uh, not held. Um, but um, we're using the thread pool, which is optimized for uh, parallelizing CPU intensive tasks, which is mm -hmm. only possible with a uh, kernel thread and not weird. Green, th green threats. Yeah. If I guess if in we, this case we don't actually need that though, right? Because all we're doing, um, we're just doing I/O. We're just waiting on SSH to like connect and. Because then we can having, just set the, the thread pool to like fifty, and it would just work, right? It it will kind of slow, but it will work. Sure. Um, if we want to use green threads, then we should rethink that soon. Okay. To see how that would look like. Um, it, it might be possible that we are ending up with a Python 3 only solution. That would be fine for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if, if we want to do that, then we should investigate it soon. But that's mainly a problem for day one, for for yeah, spawning true. many OSDs at the same time yeah. on many hosts. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's that and um, like service LS. If you basically have to just check the services on all the nodes or device yeah. LS, those also will be super slow. So, um, um, if you are refreshing the content. I mean, binding one worker threat to one host 
at least you know keeps the time to to the respond time of one single host, right? Until you're running out of threads and have more hosts, then you can spawn threads. Right. Yeah. I mean, setting the the threads dynamically to the number of hosts registered is also not too bad, right? Until you have more than thousand hosts. Right. I mean, we can set a hard lim hard limit, right? But uh, I mean, for ninety percent or ninety nine percent of the users, more than thousand nodes is is unlikely. But yeah. Uh, Well, we're using a completely different um, transport mechanism than SSH. Like, um, I don't know, awesome idea, yeah. uh, DRAMQ, for example, that, that would also work. Yeah. But then, yeah, we are, then we are really uh, doing sold over again. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think if we were going to do that, then we should just, like, pick salt agent or whatever it is and like have the bootstrap install the agent <laughs> there we go and just like pick one i think ssh is not bad for our purpose i mean for day one operations certainly this can take quite long but if we have some kind of optimization we think we can we can get it down to, to an acceptable amount of time but for day two uh, there are no not that many operations, right? So it's yeah. Some of them are long running, but they're long long running anyways, and yeah, I'll shrink it down by by using a different transport. Oh, yep. I guess fine. So the completion architecture is completely independent of how we actually schedule or make things asynchronous. Yeah. So we can just completely replace the transport mechanism without touching the actual logic of the SSH orchestrator. Yep. Yeah, right now, the only thing that, the only place where SSH um, ever comes in is a single function that's called run Ceph daemon. That mm -hmm. runs it on a remote host, and so that one function could be replaced with anything. But the thread pool is called on many places, and my composable completion reduces it to only one place where actually thread pool is called. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easier to to refactor cool. that. Cool. Cool. Okay. Is there anything we can do to get this uh, thing merged a bit more quickly? Um, doing more hardware for Shaman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's blocked on the building, right? It's, um, it's like it's everything except for the OpenSUSE one. But you should be able to run tests. Yeah. The other ones. You only need the CentOS, two CentOS ones, and the Bionic fault one. And then you can run the QA suite. You should be good. Okay, then I then I can... Run the QA suite without someone being yeah, completely without reading. Yeah. Let's see how it goes. Uh, okay, anything more regarding parallelism in the background versions? Next topic. Um, upgrades. Right, so the, the check one, um, it add, adds one function to the orchestrator API that basically asks the orchestrator to translate container names to hashes. Because um, I didn't want, right, so basically in the SSH case, it just picks a random node and does a new Ceph daemon command called, called pull um, that will pull the latest image and it'll tell you what the SHA one is for it. Um, and then it just compares that what basically what images we want to be running to whatever is actually running. Um, I should probably 
refresh my memory and look at this thing again. So this is basically the upgrade check command this, that this does. Um, and then the next step, I think, is to do the actual like minor release upgrade. Um, and I, my question there is um, how to sort of combine this with the Rook, Rook's management of upgrades, like how much of it we want to do, because with I, there are two things, I guess. So for like things like upgrading stateless services, Rook is doing it on a per deployment basis. So it basically tells Kubernetes that it wants this service set, daemon set, deployment, whatever, to be a different image, and then Kubernetes restarts them one by one. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And there's like a oh. is there a hook to like have the the check in between each one to know that you're ready to do the next one, or does Kubernetes just sort of go for it? Yeah. Well, the the operator really updates each deployment one at a time, and they're, we don't use daemon sets hardly anywhere really, except maybe in the CSI driver. So all the OSDs have okay. their individual okay. deployments, mons are individual. But the, um, so Rook is, goes on a deployment basis, which is basically going to be like five if RGW daemons, for example. But it tells Kubernetes to upgrade all five, and Kubernetes will go across the, right. yeah, Great. okay. RGW, I can't remember specifically. I think we have, yeah, we have an individual deployment, so it, for how much we wait between updating RGWs, we might just blast all the RGWs or wait for one at a time. We should wait, wait I, for one at a time. But I think the main question for me is how much of the upgrade logic should live in orchestrator CLI, sort of above the orchestration abstraction, and how much of it should be below. Did that the, what, the way that Kubernetes does it makes me think that um, the stuff above the layer should be like upgrade all the monitors first. Make sure everything's okay. Then upgrade all the OSDs. Make sure whatever, like on a per service type basis. Um, I, I mean, we, we have the logic. I mean, we have the logic to upgrade the cluster and work already. Yes, but it's like it's the simple logic, right? So it'll work fine for point releases, but um, when we do major upgrades, um, it won't because we want to have more stuff in there. So, and we need to implement that same logic for um, SSH anyway. So I think the question is whether we sort of shift, shift some of that back into the, the manager, or we sort of have two parallel things. Because for example, for like Octopus to Pacific, there's going to be a, a bunch of steps. Like after you do the monitors, then you probably fiddle some option. After the OSDs, you change the require OSD release. Like there's all this other stuff that's sprinkled in there that varies per release. We don't want to have to do that twice. We can avoid it. I th yeah, we definitely have to change how we do it in Rook if we want to move that up a level to the manager or the operator owns it right now instead of like the manager module. Yeah, yeah. And for, because for Rook, it's a, is it a single image for the entire cluster? There's basically one property. This is what for, the cluster should be. For all the Ceph demons, yeah. There's, there's the Rook operator image, and there's the, the Ceph image, all the demons. Because what, what, what I was planning on doing for um, for the manager module was, would be that you would you'd run the check just to see what it wants to do or things should happen, and then you would basically say upgrade, like start or something like that, and it would kick off a background process that would do it. And basically, for each daemon, it would update the Ceph config for that one daemon that it's going to restart, reprovision it, and and so on. And then it would work its way through. And it would have some basic state that says that the upgrade is the target is this, um, and it's in progress. So that if the manager restarts, it can pick up where it left off. And then also, you would have a CLI command that would like upgrade, pause, cancel, or something like that. Upgrade, resume. So if like it's in the middle of upgrading and restarting all this stuff, and you're like, you want to stop? <laughs> you just wanted to take a break. You can do that. Um, and it could have like a progress event also that shows that it's you know 70% the way down with the upgrade. That's sort of what I was thinking. But the operator, the work operator, like sort of owns all that, and so you don't have things like pause, right? Right. Yeah. We we talked no about progress. having pause a while back. Maybe it's been like a year ago, but. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like the option of a pause for sure. So if if this stuff was moved into the manager 
module, then basically I think the the interface would have to be a little bit richer so that um, we could tell Rook on a per daemon basis, like a per OSD basis, a per monitor basis, like to upgrade this monitor or reprovision this monitor with this image. Right. Yeah, I'm just thinking through because the, I mean, the, the way the whole end to end orchestration works in Rook, it's just every time it starts up or every time it does anything, it just runs just through does. the mons, then OSDs and our manager yeah. in yeah. that order every time it runs. So if it, if it's not going to do that anymore. I, I mean, maybe it could. So one, one option is um, there's basically a new config option called container image that says what container image you want to be running for the cluster. And Rook totally ignores that, right? It uses the CRD property. But it could it could use that because it was added as a config option so that you could have like the monitors running one image and the OSDs running a different one and OSDs 56 running a different one. So you could sort of have granular um, grin, in a granular way set the or which image. Or daemons run which image, yeah. And so if Rook just like looked at that config option for whatever daemon it was, then it could just it could use that instead of the global property. Right. And if in that case, then it almost the upgrade stuff would almost be like a Rook almost wouldn't have to do anything, right? The manager would change the option, and it would probably just have one call that says like reconsider, <laughs> look again, whatever refresh, right? And the granular list would would say. Okay, we'll update the mons, and then the operator's done. And then when the yeah. manager's ready, it would request the next one. Yeah. Like, in theory, it could kick off the full orchestration, although that would be inefficient, but it would work. That's cool. And, well, hopefully we can work on making the orchestration more efficient, too, or notice, oh, I'm only updating this section. Let me everything yeah. else. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, well, that's what I'm currently thinking, but I think we should just start with the check and get that in, and then I'll, I can prototype something with this stage and just see if it looks like it'll work well. I might, this one might actually make sense to wait also until we have like um, a release candidate <laughs> or something a little bit further. Because what I was also thinking here is as making it so that it's um, user friendly. So there would be, instead of having the config option be like the full um, container name, um, it could like leave off the tag, for example, um, or something like that. And so you, when you say the command would basically be upgrade to, you know, 14.2.6, and then we would construct the appropriate we figure out what the appropriate label is for that from from the global um, property. Yeah, because like the user doesn't necessarily care that the image is Ceph slash Ceph colon v whatever, right? They like just like I want to run this version. Um, yeah, he needs control of that global one in case he's using a different yeah registry. Yeah, but, but, but for yeah. individual or for the granular settings, we wouldn't need all that. Exactly, yeah. And also, like, it might be that, um, yeah, like, we don't necessarily want the cluster to go upgrade itself if the container image for a particular version is refreshed. Occasionally, we re regenerate containers for the same version. Um, Does it have a different base image or? Yeah, or something, right, exactly. E or whatever, who knows. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. I probably brought that one some more. Not quite sure. Okay. Anyway. Lots to think about for upgrade. Yeah. So I think the next CDM is in like two weeks, maybe. I think we should put all this stuff on the agenda. Yeah, it's December 4th. So I'll start, start adding items there. That's good. Cool, oh, okay. Okay. 
Um, next topic. Oh, okay, I created a pull request for blinking lights for SSH orchestrator. That was kind of cool. Yeah, that looked pretty good. I watched the little video demo thing. Yeah. Um, it's uh, still work in, pro work in progress, but I think it looks good. Cool. We just oh. don't have any Rook implementation for blinking lights right now. But having yeah. not looked at that yet, uh, what would we need on the Rook side, do you think? You basically just need to kick off a job that runs a command in the right container on the right node, that's it. Just a one shot, turn it on, or another one that turns it off. But there's no state, there's no nothing else. It's just run a command, basically. Run a command. So the Rook yep. manager module should go implement that command. To, yeah, run this pod on that node, eventually. One yeah. time thing. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, yeah, exactly. when you say command sage, you're talking the CLI command versus some API. Yeah. And uh, I mean, long term, we probably right. want an API. We're going to have to wire it all the way to the appropriate hardware and back end. We need an abstraction. I mean, is that stuff all defined at this point? Um, we're using libsource management as okay. the API, okay. so we don't have to think about all this stuff. Um, and so, okay. and that's now installed in the, in the base Ceph container image with a new enough version that works for okay. however many vendors had their support in that version. <laughs> so we'll want to update that periodically, but um, yeah. And that's, and that's just, an acceptable strategy upstream, I mean, for everybody, I mean. I think so. I think it's as simple yeah. as it gets. I think that the challenge is when you're like, it doesn't support my particular array. And the way to fix that is to like add support to lib storage management and have them do a release and then get that new version into our container. Okay. But but for the sake of our conversations, Suse is fine with that. We're fine with it. Uh, we are already using lip storage management. Okay, cool. Ipsy. Cool. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Uh, is Rook version Y used by the manager modules? Yeah, that was my question. So that yeah, last week at Coop kind of was talking to Seb about the upgrades and whether or not demons need to be restarted during a rook upgrade. And so the only reason the manager pod is being restarted is because of that environment variable we set on the pod back. And I didn't see anywhere in the Ceph code base that consumes that environment variable. I remember adding it a few months ago, uh, but I can't remember. I don't see where, um, where in the manager modules we were going to use that? We used to use it. Did you maybe maybe got removed? Um, possibly with the introduction of call of of v1 of Rook that got. Removed. I don't know. But I don't think that we're using a Rook version. Yeah, we're not using it now, definitely. Okay. How about if we go ahead and just remove it from the Rook side yeah. and then we'll, it, if we need it in the future, then we can look at how to add it back in a smarter way so it doesn't cause this upgrade issue. The, the Rook version itself doesn't really matter. It's about, um, the Rook API version, which is more important. But right. as long as it be one, that's that should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe with that. Sounds good. Okay. And then, yeah, on the upgrade topic though, there the so if you're doing a, a rook upgrade, not updating the Ceph image. The only demons that were restarting were the manager, the manager because of that, and then the OSDs. The OSDs are going to need a lot more work to mm -hmm. avoid the reboot because basically we need to activate the the LV when we start the 
SSD before we start the Ceph process. We've got yeah. we've got the Rook image in the set the OSD pod spec. Yeah. And Kubernetes is the one that forces the restarts. Yes. Right. As soon as we update the pod spec, it, it just restarts. It's, it just does it. Okay. And the Rook image is only in the init container officially in the pod spec, but yeah. it, any yeah. change to the pod spec causes a restart. Okay. Yeah, so we can figure out how to... Okay. If, if we could see... Well, it'd really be a hack if we tried to not restart the OSDs right now until we fix the LVM. Activate to not be necessary. That's the I mean, the way that about. the way that um, the SSH orchestrator is doing it is it's just running the volume activate. That's like the one command that it runs inside the container as the init prep stage stage or whatever. But maybe the the rook pod spec can be a, to do the same thing where it just runs the activate command without having running rook and asking rook to do the same thing. The I think what we found is we had to run activate in the same container as when we called Ceph OSD. Because if we did it in an init container, the tempfs would be lost. That's what I thought too. Um, and I actually added a, made a patch to Ceph volume to add a, like a dash dash without tempfs, so it would write actual files. But I found that if the, if the varlib Ceph OSD Ceph dash number directory was already a mount point, which it just happened to be in the Ceph daemon case because that was being passed in from the, the host on that point, then we don't mount a mess, we don't do a temp fs. Ceph volume just skips it. Or maybe oh, if it already exists, thing. maybe something. It was there was some there's some subtle thing where it just worked. I didn't have to do anything. Right. Maybe we can work around that without changing the MC. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. But yeah. you have some notes on that somewhere or no, I just just on. worked. But it's basically just that if that directory already exists, I think it'll just work. You could probably just do you could probably do a test um, on some host where if you do if you do an activate and it does a tempfs like tear it all down and then just make through that directory and then run it again and it, it works. Okay. I think that was the I think that was the difference. If we just make sure the directory exists that the activate is working on. I think so. And if it's not that. It's, if, if you make it a bind mount, then that was, it's either the fact that it existed or the fact that it was a mount point. I'm not sure which thing it was, but one of those two things made it just not, not do temp with us. It just worked. Yeah, because Rook can create a mount of volume between the init container and have it use the same volume in OSD daemon, so. Yeah, yeah, and it can be an empty dir, right? Like it. Exactly. It, yeah. Yeah. Cool, we'll try that. Yeah, someone came to the Rook booth and talked to Seb. I wasn't there at the time, but they said, yeah, there's this one issue where we're, we're not sure we can deploy Rook because of this one thing, and it's because the OSDs are restarted during Rook upgrade. Like, why do that? Yeah, okay. We don't want to do that. Fix it. Okay. Um, last thing, um, right now when you do a service discovery, um, it's doing an exec inside every container um, just to run Ceph-V to get the Ceph version, which is, there are two problems. One, it's it's slow. The second problem is on my latest Fedora, um, Podman exec seems to be broken. <laughs> but I guess that's my problem and not anybody else's. Um, but I really want there just to be a label on the container that just has the set version that is in that container. And for some reason, because of the way that the, the make file works for generating the Docker files and whatever, it's just like awkward to do that. Um, so it's not an easy change, but um, I think we really should do it. I think it'll be worth it because then you'll just do it and inspect on the image and you'll know what's inside without having to like run the image, <laughs> run this stuff touch me inside or something. Um, I don't know who, I mean, 
I don't know who we can bug to do that. Sebastian, I don't know if there's anybody over there who wants to might be able to take tackle that one. Um, I wonder if work is doing the same thing. Like if you're trying to figure out what version of Ceph is in the container image, do you like you like launch a job that does it right? Yeah, yeah we yeah. actually launch a job, get the output. Yeah. So you could skip that step. You could just look at you could just inspect the container image probably using That's a similar API. Properties. Yeah. I think we, we tried to figure that out because the the image had properties, but without actually running the image, we couldn't figure out how to Yeah. Well, the current image doesn't have the property that tells you what version is inside, so it tells you the SHA one of the Ceph container dot git is like totally useless. <laughs> right. Nobody cares. The actual Ceph version. Yeah, if we could figure out how to inspect an image, it'd be awesome. Yep. All right. Sebastian, is there any chance that one of you guys can take a look at that one? Oh. Um. That version. Um. I have to to talk to Christopher. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think the last big refactor on Ceph Container was done by Blaine about a year ago. Um, okay. So he might have like the background, but I imagine he's super busy, so I don't necessarily. Um. I'm 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 going to talk to to Christopher and uh, to to Blaine. Christopher basically took over the whole container part of uh, from Blaine, so I guess it's going to be Christopher. Cool. Cool. Okay. Sweet. Okay. All right. That's good. Guess that's, all I guess that's it for today. Yeah. Sage and uh, Travis, I did uh, send out a meeting for four. If you guys want to join Travis, I just added you. I don't know if you want. And hopefully Paul can join. <laughs> That's predicated on that. I'll let you guys know. I'll cancel it if you can. I'll find out at 2.30. Sounds good. Awesome. All right. All right. Okay, talk to you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Yeah.